From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Venezuela takes pride in having what the former U.S. President Jimmy Carter described as the best voting system in the world. More than 13 audits are carried out before, during and after the election. Ian Bruce reports on the preparations for a transparent poll on May 20th. For the sixth time so far before Sunday's election, Venezuela's voting system is being put to the test. They call this one the Zero Error Audit the most important step before they send these electronic voting machines to polling stations close to Caracas. It checks the complete chain of the process from the digital identity checks and the vote itself through the data transmission to the final computation of the results. It includes every detail, including what to do, for example, when a disabled voter is unable to mark their fingerprint. We've already had two exceptional situations, when the voter is missing a finger and we need a code from the president of the voting station to authorize their vote. But we only have permission to allow two exceptional cases. If there's a third case, we have to call the National Support Center and they have to give us the key. There'll be four more audits before Sunday and several more on the day and after the election. The Venezuelan Electoral Authority, the CNE, has long taken pride in its voting system. It says it's the most thoroughly audited in the world and effectively fraud-proof. Now they've incorporated further guarantees in line with two agreements with the opposition. We have been implementing faithfully every detail contained in both the Santo Domingo Accord and the later Caracas Agreement with the candidates. They've already dispatched voting machines like these to Venezuela's more distant states. On Friday, 34,143 of them will be installed and ready to go. Ian Bruce, Talisur, Caracas. The Vice President of the National Electoral Council, or CNE, Sandra Oblitas, announced that all the materials for Sunday's general elections have been distributed throughout the country. Oblitas said polling centers will receive their electronic voting machines on Friday and Saturday. The President of the CNE, Tibisay Lucena, said the voting facilities are safeguarded. She added the materials handed over to international observers are being held in their respective embassies and consulates in Venezuela. President Nicolás Maduro took his campaign trail to the state of Anzuategui less than a week before the presidential election. At the rally, Maduro promised he would lead the changes Venezuela needs to favor the people. He also said the people have the right to choose democratically. We can't sell our country. We won't give away our country. We have to go to vote and choose. Venezuela has the right to choose with their vote in a democratic way. I ask the world, open your eyes and see what's happening in Venezuela. I ask the international press to look at the people of Venezuela and to see that there are people able to defend their peace, their country, their lives. Meanwhile, opposition candidate Henry Falcón campaigned in the state of Barinas. In a tweet, Falcón said, people are committed to defending democracy and to work for prosperity and peace. The Kellogg company has announced it is closing operations in Venezuela. The company said in a statement on Tuesday that it was prompted to cease operations as a result of the current economic and social deterioration in the country. Workers arriving at the Maracay offices were met with a notice taped to the gate informing them that the company had been forced to close. President Nicolás Maduro responded saying he's handing the company over to the people. The company Kellogg's will continue producing now in the hands of the working class. And we will initiate the legal actions to request the red code of the owners and shareholders of the Kellogg's company so that they pay in the courts and pay in justice. They have to respect the laws of Venezuela. An opposition candidate, Henry Falcón, had also something to say on the company's closure. On Twitter, he said Kellogg's is just one of the thousands of companies that have ceased operations in the country. He said that despite its promises, the government has not been able to fix the situation over the years. 
Also in Venezuela, people protested outside the United States Embassy in Caracas on Tuesday to oppose the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. The demonstrators reaffirmed the country's support to the Palestinian cause. They also condemned the use of military weapons by Israel at the Gaza border, where 60 people were killed on Monday and more than 2,700 were injured as Palestinians protested the U.S. move and demanded their return to their land as they do every year. Also, people around Latin America have held protests demanding an end to crimes against the Palestinian people. Demonstrators gathered in Chile, home of the biggest Palestinian community outside the Arab world, as well as in Brazil and Argentina. Turkey has ordered the Israeli Consul General in Istanbul to leave the country following the killings of Palestinian protesters by Israeli forces. Turkey has been among the most vocal critics of the Israeli use of deadly force against Palestinian demonstrators at the Gaza border. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan described Monday's bloodshed as genocide and called Israel a terrorist state. Paraguayan president-elect Mario Abdo Benitez says his government will reconsider the current administration's decision to move its embassy to Jerusalem. Abdo Benitez said Israel is a great friend of his country, but the decision has to be discussed with maturity. Current president Horacio Cartes announced at the beginning of the month that Paraguay will follow the United States and move its embassy to Jerusalem. The move is scheduled for the end of May. Un aplauso, por favor. Meanwhile, Guatemala has opened its embassy in Jerusalem, just two days after the U.S. made the same decision. Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu attended the embassy's opening in an office complex in West Jerusalem. Guatemala was one of the only a few nations that backed U.S. President Donald Trump's decision in December to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Arab League in Cairo will hold a meeting to discuss what they call the illegal relocation of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. The meeting will urge the League's permanent representatives to condemn this decision. Arab League Chief Ahmed Abul Gate said the move was a clear violation of international law. We'll take a short break now, but join us after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Relatives of the kidnapped and murdered employees of Ecuador's newspaper, El Comercio, are in Colombia to ask for help in the recovery of their bodies. 
The two journalists and their driver died at the Ecuadorian-Colombian border last April, allegedly murdered by the Oliver Sinisterra Front Armed Group. Now their families want the Colombian government to help find their bodies and also to join an ongoing international investigation to find out what really happened. We ask for help to recover the bodies. We are making all the possible efforts as a family so that we can give them a dignified burial. We need to know what is being done to recover them and why the Colombian government so far has not given the green light to the investigating commission. A group of investigators presented a report into ongoing electoral fraud in Colombia. This poses a risk to democracy in the country. A mafia network inside the National Registration Office and the manipulation of public documents were two of the many topics in this report. Leon Valencia, director of the Peace and Reconciliation Foundation, reported that the Registration Office is altering the results of elections by selling vote packs. They sell them for around $600. This is what they call an electoral reserve. These are being sold by corrupt lawyers, officials, former officials, and politicians inside the institution. Irregularities may have been happening as far back as when election judges were first chosen. The e-forms, in which the results of each voting station are registered, were manipulated. We don't like the random and shady way in which the people in charge of every polling station were selected. Before, there were also people arriving at the stations even before the people in charge had arrived. In second place, there were more than 2,000 E14 forms that don't match with the official results. According to investigations, these are not only files being altered. The digitalization of data goes into a software system that has already been manipulated before. We ask for an audit to know the main codes, algorithms and the randomness of the system. In spite of the alerts and reports, the National Registration Office hasn't taken actions to eliminate electoral fraud. We have reported about this before. We told them that illegal funding of campaigns could happen and how it could have been manipulated by corrupt political figures. Colombians don't trust the results of the elections. There is more behind this. We still don't know the whole truth, but we all must vote to take the power back. Electoral corruption puts Colombian democracy in great risk. Still in Colombia, the National Liberation Army, or ELN, has announced a temporary ceasefire to facilitate the presidential elections. The announcement came after peace talks with the Colombian government were renewed in Havana last Thursday. Our correspondent in Bogotá, Paola Fernández, brings us all the details. The National Liberation Army announced a ceasefire from the 25th of May until Tuesday, May 29th. What they say, the National Liberation Army, is that they want best conditions for the presidential elections that will take place on Sunday, May 27th. We should recall that this announcement was made in Havana, Cuba, after the peace talks were moved from Quito, after Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno withdrew his country as a host for the dialogue. The last ceasefire between the National Liberation Army and the Colombian government lasted from the 1st of October to January 12th this year. What the guerrilla expect, as well as some social movements, is that some of the core mistakes are not repeated again. They want the Colombian government to respect the ceasefire, even though it was announced as an unilateral and temporary one. According to Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos, great advances have been made since the fifth cycle of dialogue was renewed in Cuba in order to achieve a permanent ceasefire agreed by both sides. That was Paula Fernandez from Bogotá. Another journalist has been killed in Mexico, this time in the state of Jalisco. Juan Carlos Huerta was shot dead on Tuesday morning as he left his home. The state governor, Arturo Núñez, said the killing was not a robbery, but an execution, linked to his work as a journalist. Huerta hosted a television program and was the director of a radio station in Tabasco. He is the fourth Mexican journalist killed this year and the 32nd in the last five years. 
In Guatemala, five businessmen who illegally financed the 2015 electoral campaign that led to the presidency of Jimmy Morales has been, have been called to appear in court. The announcement was made by the Prosecutor's Office and the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala. The businessmen have already asked for forgiveness for having given $1.2 million to Morales' party, the National Convergence Front. They will appear in court on June 1st. The Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles, has described the UK's Windrush scandal in which Britons of Caribbean origin were deported as a morality tale. Speaking at a UWE event in Jamaica, the Barbadian historian said that despite their contribution to the British economy, the Windrush generation had to endure the humiliation of being told they would never be British. Where next will they want us to labor? Where will be the next place where they will take us? Why do we not focus on building our economies and societies? And this is what the conversation is. If we have more economic growth in this region, will our people be exposed to this circuit of unskilled labor? So it comes back to us. It comes back to us. The ball is back with us that we do, in fact, need to put all hands on deck to get our economies to function at a higher level of development. That is the cure. It's the only cure to all of this. The Cuban Foreign Affairs Minister Bruno Rodriguez has met the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Federica Mogherini, in Brussels. During the meeting, Rodriguez and Mogherini signed a collaboration agreement to promote renewable energies in the Caribbean island. An agreement on food security and sustainable agriculture is already underway. Relations between the EU and Cuba deteriorated after EU's common position passed in 1996, a veto to the relations with the island, but the dialogue between the parties has now resumed. Cuba is presenting its human rights record to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. Cuba will show the progress it has made in applying its socio-economic model that seeks to guarantee as many rights as possible. This is the third time Cuba's human rights will be reviewed by the UN Committee, which checks human rights in all member countries every four years. In Argentina, families and friends of the crew of the submarine that disappeared in the South Atlantic six months ago marched in silence to ask for the search mission to be continued. They gathered at the Mar del Plata naval base, where the 44 crew members of the Ara San Juan submarine were supposed to arrive last year. Over a dozen countries have supported Argentina in the search, but no trace of the submarine has been found so far. There is an ongoing investigation to determine what happened and who should be held responsible for the disappearance. All I ask is that you keep looking for them. Please, do not abandon them. I know the government thinks that retrieving the submarine is a lot of money, but do the 44 lives inside worth less than retrieving a submarine? They are not doing things well. They do not act fast. We do not know how to ask them, what door to knock on so they can listen to us, that we need them to look for them and find them. Let's go to our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Edgardo Esteban, with more on this story. Six months have passed since the disappearance of the Ara San Juan submarine. There is still no news of the crew. The Argentine Navy has stopped all searches, despite the promises of President Mauricio Macri. Yesterday, the family members of the disappeared marched to the National Congress to ask for the search to continue. The Argentinian state wants to give compensation to the families of the missing submarine crew members to recognize their disappearance. Meanwhile, the families continue to ask for the search for the submarine to continue. The situation is a difficult one, not made any easier with a lack of concrete answers or even a real response by the government of Mauricio Macri. That was Edgardo Esteban from Buenos Aires. Outrage sparked after Argentina's Football Association, or AFA, released a dossier with instructions on how to seduce Russian women. 
The book was aimed to managers, players and journalists that were attending a preparation course for the 2018 World Cup in Russia. The manual on Russian language and culture tells men what to do to have a chance with a Russian woman. In, this, in part of it, the report, it says, Russian girls pay close attention to whether you're clean, you smell good and you're well dressed. The first impression is very important to them. The manual also says, there are many beautiful women in Russia and not all of them are good for you. Be selective. The AFA has yet to give explanations on this manual. We'll take a short break now, but join us after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. North Korea has threatened to cancel the upcoming highly anticipated summit between U.S. President Donald Trump and its leader Kim Jong-un. In a statement, North Korea said the move was due to, quote, provocative military disturbances with South Korea. The warning comes as North Korea's state news outlet KCNA reported North Korea has also suspended talks with South Korea because of a joint military drill conducted by the US and South Korea. All of this threatens the upend progress made at the end of April when Kim Jong-un crossed into South Korea for a historic meeting with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in. The US State Department has announced it will continue to plan for the summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un regardless of this announcement. Under um, the idea and the notion that the president's meeting is going forward with Chairman with Chairman Kim next month. And if this meeting doesn't happen, that's, will you? That's still a hypothetical. Go that's a hypothetical. You know, look, this news just came out. I can't verify it just yet. Um, it's very early on in the process, but we're planning ahead for our meetings. Burundi is mourning the brutal killing of 28 people last week. Here's more on that story and some other ones that are making headlines around the world. Burundi is holding burial ceremony for 28 victims who were killed on Friday in an attack by armed rebels in Sibitoke, northwest of the country. The attack came just a week before Burundians are due to vote in a key referendum that could extend the presidential term from five to seven years. This would allow President Pierre Nakurunziza to rule for another 14 years until 2034. He has been in power since 2005. An estimated 1,200 people have been killed and 400,000 people have fled the country since the political unrest began in April 2015, according to the UN. We will spare no effort to stop these criminals, and the work is at an advanced stage. Burundi is working closely with the Democratic Republic of Congo, which houses the criminals. We are calming the population. We will do everything to stop and punish these criminals according to the law. Indonesian police have shot dead four men who used samurai swords to attack officers at the police headquarters in the city of Pengkabaru. Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. The strike comes days after a series of suicide bombings by ISIS militants targeting churches and a police building in the city of Surabaya leaving 30 dead. 
Police say children were used as suicide bombers in the attacks. The Global Arms and Chemical Watchdog Organization says chlorine was probably used as a chemical weapon in a February attack on the Syrian town of Sarakeb. However, the watchdog did not say which country was responsible for the chlorine weapons use. An OPCW fact-finding team is currently awaiting results for town of Duma after medics said 40 people died in a chlorine and sarin attack in April. Syria and Russia have accused foreign hands in the use of toxic gas attack on the Syrian people. A competition to find the tastiest French bread in Paris has been won by a baker from La Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean. The Baguette Bake Off was a part of the Fais du Pan or Bread Festival, which encourages bakers to try new recipes and organizes outdoor bakeries and public tastings. The prestigious contest aims to find the best baguette baked in the French tradition. And with that tasty story, we come to the end of this news brief. But this and other stories, you can find them on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And be sure to follow us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.